Now in the previous video, what we were doing was adding two fractions together, or subtracting them, and combining them into a single simplified fraction. And that would seem like a perfect place to be, okay? I've got it as my lovely single fraction, fully simplified, okay? Nothing could get better than that. However, here is an example of a simplified fraction, single fraction, okay? It's had two fractions, they've been added together, and I've got to this result. Let's say I now want to integrate it. Well, there we have a problem, okay? Um, we have a problem because we can't actually physically integrate that as it stands, okay? Um, we can't use integration by parts. We've got this trouble of having these two brackets in the denominator, which are causing the problem. Um, integration by substitution won't work either. So what can we do? Well, that's where the process of breaking this fraction apart and putting it back into two separate fractions makes sense and a reason as to why we would do that. So this is a process known as partial fractions, okay? So we're going to be splitting a, a perfectly good fraction up into two or more pieces which will enable us to do uh, integration with it or a number of other problems, solve, another one, uh, solve a number of other problems as well. So that is the reasons to why we're going about this. Now, how do we do it? That's the next question. Well, if um, we looked at an example, okay? So if I looked at um, the fraction 19 over 24, then that fraction... I could write down as 1 over 24 plus 18 over 24, okay, for example. Now, the 18 over 24, of course, that simplifies because you can divide top and bottom by 6, and you get 3 quarters, okay? So, I could write out a few other ways of doing it. I could have uh, 2 over 24 plus 17 over 24. Now, of course, 2 over 24 is just 1 over 12, so I could write it like that. Or I could write it as 3 over 24 plus 16 over 24. Now, 3 over 24 is 1 eighth. 16 over 24, dividing top and bottom by 4, is, uh, well, 4 over 6. OK, uh, but you could divide top and bottom by 8, of course. I should have spotted that immediately, so that's 2 thirds. OK, so here are a few different ways of writing 19 over 24. And what you should really notice is in the denominators, in each of these cases, we have factors of 24. So it makes sense, then, that we would be able to split this up into an equivalent expression. That's why I'm using the three lines here, this equivalency, okay? This side is precisely the same as this side. So it's going to be something over x minus 2, because that's a factor of the whole of the denominator, and plus something over x plus 1 this other factor, okay? So this is like my 24 and 4, for example, or 12 and 24, or 8 and 3. Now, if we've got it in that stage, then what I can then do, because I want to work out what that A and the B have to be, I could multiply both sides by this x minus 2, x plus 1, in order to get rid of these fractions. So if I do that, multiplying both sides by the x minus 2x plus 1. When I multiply this by x minus 2x plus 1, the x minus 2s cancel, and I get left with x a times x plus 1. And when I multiply this fraction 
by x minus 2, x plus 1. The x plus 1s cancel, and I get left with the b times x minus 2. So that leaves me with this line here. Now, it's going to be important that you can move from that line to that line without really much thought. So look and see as to this fraction doesn't have the x plus 1, so that's what goes in front. This fraction doesn't have the x minus 2, and so that's what goes in front. OK? Now, there are two methods from here on out, uh, depending on how you've been taught. Uh, one way is comparing coefficients, OK? That's not the way that I do it, OK? That's just a personal preference. So if you do uh, comparing coefficients, then um, you can go about it that way. I use substitution, OK? Because it makes, uh, does make a lot of sense. So what we're going to do is, because this is equivalent, because that means that this side is precisely the same as the right-hand side, then that means it must work for all x's. There must, it, both sides must be the same for all values of x in order for that to be equivalent. So that allows me to now substitute values of x in to simplify the problem. So I could substitute in, so I could let x be equal to 2, for example, and I'm going to get 2 plus 7 on the, right, the left-hand side, and that's going to be the same as a lots of 2 plus 1 on the right-hand side, so that's 3a. And of course, when I put 2 in there, the bracket becomes 0, and, and so I have b times 0, so I don't need to worry about it. And that's why I chose 2. I chose 2 to cancel out one of the brackets. So that allows me to then say that a would have to be 3. If I do the same and I knock out that bracket, then x could be minus 1. Then I've got minus 1 plus 7, which is 6. And then I've got, well, that bracket's 0. Minus 1 take away 2 is minus 3, so minus 3b. And that means that b would have to be minus 2. And I now have that x plus 7 over x minus 2, x plus 1, is precisely the same as 3 over x minus 2 plus, or oh sorry, minus 2 over x plus 1. Now, in order to make yourself fully convinced that this process has worked, we could always combine these two fractions together like we did in the previous video and do 3 times x plus 1, so 3x plus 3, take away 2 times x minus 2, so take away 2x, and then minus 2 times minus 2 is plus 4, all over x minus 2, x plus 1. Now, of course, the denominator is going to be the same, but we just need to make sure that the numerator is the same. 3x take away 2x is just 1x, and you've got plus 3, plus 4, so plus 7. And so clearly, this process has worked. OK? And that would now allow me to integrate this if I wanted to, OK, using logarithms. But this is the process that we're going to be going through. And we're going to see some more examples and uh, more complicated examples coming up in this section.